Well, thank you guys for spending some time with me. Um, I have in my possession here an instrument I, I am really unworthy of. Uh, it's on loan. It's a Warwick bass. And by the configuration of the pickups, it's kind of like a kind of a jazz bass kind of thing. And uh, I'm kind of breaking it in. And no, I don't have it plugged into an amp. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to uh, uh, bore you guys with my awful bass playing. What, when I usually pay, play bass on my own pieces, it's usually just like the bass proper part. You know, just like if you need like that. But something that's like a really cool groove, something like that, I, I got to practice it for weeks. I got to come up with the part. And uh, sometimes I have people that really know what the heck they're doing with the bass guitar, <laughs> play it. But sometimes I like to challenge myself, even though if it takes two weeks for me to play a bass part that I hear in my head. And uh, next week I, on Music Monday, I can run through that track. Let me see. What if Dan Dombrowski... Oh, I missed that. Uh, what if Dan Dombrowski had a crossover? Hmm. I don't understand that. But uh, send me a uh, send me a, a, a Instagram message diagramming that, and I'll give you an answer. I like the wooden texture. Yeah, it's a beautiful instrument. This is like like way above my skill set as far as uh, being a bass player goes. And uh, the Masari household is full of people that are online. My wife works at Disney, and. <laughs> She's talking to all of her uh, 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 business associates there. So if you hear conversations way in the background, that's that's what's happening. I picked this particular location in the house because the lighting is perfect. Um, what else we got here? Anyone want to do a shout out about what they're working on? Hey, creepy cool kid. I have my guitar on the back. Uh, oh, you painted Rudy. Um... Ja Jackie ja Jacquez 16619 says, I have my guitar on the back. I have painted Rudy. That's got to be awesome. You should send me that picture. I will definitely post that and share it. What else we got to go through here? Uh, it looks gorgeous. Thank you. It is a beautiful instrument. Like I said, I'm not worthy of it. It's, it's really great. It's got... Um, there is a collection of knobs one is for uh volume and then there's one here that's a double knob that like like is a low cut high cut of uh and there's uh, various tone knobs they uh also control uh <clears throat> which uh, pi uh which pickup uh, that you would favor when you're playing that's how you get a nice tone and uh, usually when i play bass or i have a bass player play I have them give me a direct, like direct from the instrument itself that goes, gets recorded. And then if they have an amplifier or some kind of a, <clears throat> a stomp box or something like that, that they like the sound, I get that also. And so I mix, either mix the two. Hey, Mary Lou Mandel, you you put me up to this. So this is, this is your doing. <laughs> so anyways, um, uh, and I'll do the same thing. I'll go straight in, just dry, and then mess with it till it matches the track, you know, because sometimes the bass is, it's very, um, hey, Declarus, Spells, it's good to see you guys. Um, hey, uh, Maria, Maria plays violin on a lot of my tracks. Um, yes, yes, Mary Lou Mandel, I am doing it. <laughs> I figured, last I talked to Mary Lou Mandel, she says, you got to do a Music Mondays. And actually, she said something like, you have to do a Masari Music Mondays, because you have Masari Music Monday, you have M. And I thought, ah, I don't want to put my name on it. That's kind of like, it's too egotistical. Anyways, back to bass playing really quick. Um, so, uh, you want to be able to get the tone of the bass to match the rest of the track or have a particular character that sticks out because usually the bass is right as you're listening to on your headphones the bass is right in the center and so it has to have enough character to uh 
uh, support the track. So pretty damn good making it up as you go. Well, thanks a lot, Bryson. I, I uh, you know, I mean, if you guys are going to see me crash and burn, you're going to witness it. Uh, you would have been the new 3M. That's right. The 3M, which do we know what 3M stands for? It used to be, uh, it's a tape company, but I, I think it has Minnesota Mining something. Uh, I know the first two M's of 3M are Minnesota Mining. There's like, if you ever get tape, you know, how do I know all these things? I, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I don't know, <laughs> by the way, but I do know what 3M stands for. I once owned a trumpet. Oh, I used to play trumpet too. Oh my goodness. Do you still play? Do you ha When's the last time you played your trumpet? What songs do you play? Do I play? I, I play, I don't play songs. I just play. Hey, Brian Banks. Uh, Brian Banks is an awesome dude in my life. He ran a company called Audio Banks. He's probably really embarrassed I'm talking about him. But um, we met at the dog park. Okay, I'll get back to me playing bass and all that later. More important to talk about Brian Banks. So I had a dog. And uh, under the Hollywood sign, there's like a unofficial dog park. And I met this guy, Brian Banks. I go, gosh, that name sounds familiar. And later on, um, <clears throat> I found out that, oh, gosh, that's the guy that played on all those uh, David Bowie albums. He's done programming and uh, um, for Michael Jackson and all kinds of uh, musicians. Anyways, he had a music production um company and they did tons of great commercials tons so i did a tour of duty for like oh i guess four or five years and it's the was the most fun i've ever had uh making music and um we have some really great stories and uh there's some stories i tell that i won't bore you guys with maybe i'll tell you at some other point where uh, uh we we crossed this is before texting was a thing and email and social media and all that sort of stuff and um and um uh, i got the wires crossed <laughs> on a big recording session <laughs> so i'll tell that next time because i'm too embarrassed to talk about it right now but it's uh uh but it's definitely interesting and it's a, a good lesson in like how to deal with chaos and still make something happen even though um i felt like a com complete dummy who else is here um, hey, my sister would love to have that bass. I bet she would, and I bet she could play it better than I can. That's for certain. So, um, I don't own many basses. I used to have a, um, a 1970 Fender Precision bass, and it just sat around collecting dust, and I, I, I gave it to another musician who was far better than I was. And so anytime I need to play bass... A really cool friend of mine will just say, come to the place, you come to my studio, you can pick any bass except those three, and they're usually the three best basses. And so uh, this one just happened to be one of the really cool ones he didn't want to use, he hasn't been wanting to use for a while. So that's the reason why I have this. Uh, let me see, I'm going to scroll through. Hey, John, how was the meetup on Saturday? Oh, hey, um... How you doing? Uh, yeah, the, the meetup on Saturday is really nice, very COVID compliant, uh, really awesome people. It was at um, uh, Halloween Depot uh, in an industrial part of uh, Southgate, and there was just a really sweet collection of people that came by, and a lot of a lot of very talented artists that like create uh, genre art, you know. Um, of all sorts, masks and uh, things that you could put. Name three of my favorite composers. Well, of course you have to ask me a really hard question. Um, I'll I'll get back to that, Kimberly. Uh, anyways, so it turned out really well. It's, it's kind of like a family event. I'm Italian and I, I like it when the big thrill I get with people coming over to the house and having dinner and things like that is that they're all enjoying themselves and everyone's just happy. To me, that's the best thing in the world. And that's kind of like what it was like um, last Saturday uh, at uh, Halloween, um, at the Halloween, De Halloween Depot. Really great people. And I think I'm going to be doing some with Spooksy Boo, Spooksy Boo events um, in December. I don't have an exact date. Okay, back to Kimberly. What are your three? Well, Kimberly, what are your favorite three composers? Let me throw the question back at you. I, I don't have three favorite composers, 
I have lots of composers that I like for particular reasons. I will tell you, during this pandemic, I've rediscovered uh, Anton Bruckner. Um, when I was in college, um, it was really interesting. When I went to school at UCLA, some people like dismissed composers. They said, oh, like Brahms is really kind of like Beethoven, so why listen to Brahms? And it's like, why would you dismiss Brahms? I mean, not, not only and the guy, the guy left a, led a really tough life. And from that, he was able to write all this incredible music. And so I discovered Anton Bruckner. I've been studying his music. And the way I study music is uh, I listen to the piece. The piece has to uh, listen with my ears. I don't bother looking at the score or anything like that. And I let the piece live with me. I listen to it over and over again. And Anton Bruckner is known for his symphonies. And his symphonies are very long. They're Each one, I don't think there's one of his symphonies that's under an hour long. So, um, uh, and he was also friends with Gustav Mahler. Uh, I hope I'm not boring all you people. But anyways, I'll listen to the music. Then I found this great YouTube channel that you can listen to a great recording of the music and they have the score of that composer in the composer's hand. The pages will, you know, they'll, like a slideshow, will turn in sequence to the music. So um, I, uh, that's what I've been doing lately, is Anton Bruckner. So uh, there's, there's one of uh, my favorite composers. Uh, there's a lot of other composers. Um, there's composer, uh, you know, I, I, I have friends that are composers. Um, I love the, and anytime I see a movie with Christopher Young's music in it, when Christopher Young and I went to the same school, he's, he, um, I graduated, I finished a year before him. And as you know, Christopher Young, right? Hellraiser amongst many other incredible, uh, pieces of music he's done. Uh, those are one of my favorites. Okay. Now I have to pick a third one. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll pick Barry McCreary because I like his music and he's a nice guy on top of it. On top of it all. Okay, see if we got any other questions here. My uncle plays trumpet. Oh, wow. Trumpet is not an easy instrument to play. I mean, when I first started playing, I think I was in the seventh grade. And after about two weeks, you know, uh, my mom told some friends, Oh, uh, John, go play trumpet for company. I go, uh, I can't. And just, I could barely get a tone out. You know, so it was so embarrassing. It's one of my embarrassing moments in life, musically. Um, but uh, the trumpet, it takes years to uh, develop an embouchure. And it's interesting, there's a lot of uh, composer friends of mine. There are trumpet players that I never knew. We, we kind of admit, admit to it after the fact. Uh, there's a guy I went to college with. He still plays trumpet. His name is Michael Miller. And then there's uh, Brian Ralston. If you guys know Brian Ralston, he's a composer a friend of mine. He played the trumpet also. And it's, uh, it's very physically demanding, and you have to constantly practice. I remember taking my mouthpiece. If we went to Disneyland, I would take my mouthpiece. And when everything was really noisy and stuff like that, I'd sit there buzz on it. Just to keep my muscle. This is called the embouchure. Just keep that muscle in perfect shape you know and uh there are some trumpet players that will they have a they have a practice trumpet they keep in their car and if they get really bored they'll go to the car <laughs> they'll go to their car and practice for an hour anyways uh hey bryson john when can we get some banana bread uh i don't know brian uh, i don't know bryson you'd have to come over and amy will make it for you i think if we send it in the mail it's gonna not gonna work out well uh, it was a great event, such a great community. Yes, hey, uh, uh, Trix, the trickster, really awesome girl that's a clown. She's like terrifying, but she's so sweet. Um, yeah, maybe next time you can make it. And then let me see here. What do we have? Do you have, do you like Radiohead? Yeah, I love Radiohead. Are you kidding? Uh, there was one concert I saw they did where. They just had a bunch of other guys peripheral that were sampling their music and putting it through stomp boxes and playing at the same time. That is, that was so awesome. Um, Van Halen running with the devil. Yes. Yes, I love Van Halen. Uh, Jonathan Padilla, Hellraiser. I'm kind of like falling behind in my comments here. Sorry, sorry you guys. 
JP, how you doing? Uh, JP in the house. How you doing? Jonathan Padilla. Yes, Jonathan Padilla is in the house. Hey, Bryson. Any love for Hans Zimmer, James Horner, and Joey Goldsmith? Yes, very much so. Hans Zimmer, um, what I appreciate about Hans Zimmer is that he's basically, oh, my cousin is here. Augusto Veroni. Ciao, cugino. I, um, I'm going to be doing this not every Monday, but on a Monday, maybe every two weeks or three weeks or something like that when I have something interesting to say. Okay, someone hit me with a question. What, uh, Hans Zimmer, James Horner, Jerry Goldsmith. Well, James Horner um, went to at UCLA for, I think he got one of his degrees at UCLA. So I actually talked to him a few times when he was there, and I talked to him professionally. I wanted to orchestrate for him, but at the time he was using... Um, Thomas Newman, and then he used uh, a friend of mine who's my roommate, uh, Don Davis, who did The Matrix. So Don Davis was um, orchestrating for um, James Horner. Um, so James Horner music, I really, uh, I really love his music. My favorite score of his that is just is um, um, uh, is um, the baseball movie. And I can't remember it off the bat. Oh, Field of Dreams. I love Field of Dreams. Such a heartfelt, soulful uh, uh, score. Um, Hans Zimmer, um, his, uh, mu his music for Interstellar was quite stellar for me. I really liked that because the concept of the score was the director just told him, gave him a, a direction like a subject matter. In other words, he didn't see the movie and figure out what to do. It was purely from an emotional standpoint, right? So the director, uh, Christopher Nolan, told him uh, about a set of emotions. Can you express that musically? And so Hans Zimmer, after you know, a few weeks or whatever, came back with some music for it and says, that's perfect, we'll use that in our movie. What's the movie about? Well, it's a space movie. <laughs> so I just thought that was really great. Uh, Jerry Goldsmith, I love everything that Jerry Goldsmith does. Um, the uh, scores that he did in the 50s and 60s, he's actually done some westerns. If you look on YouTube, you'll find some old TV westerns and and uh, movies from the 50s and going into the 60s that were westerns that he did. They're really good. You can see uh, the brilliance of his um, development. Okay, um, and let me see. Uh, that's what I do with my trombone mouthpiece sometimes. Yes, you but you got to keep your embouchure. Um, uh, it's tough switching between that and saxophone. Oh, that's interesting. So, so Haley, you play saxophone and. The trombone. Wow, that's incredible. I have a, a very good friend who's an excellent, uh, he's just a stellar musician, um, uh, Anthony Parther. He plays all the woodwinds, all the woodwinds. He also plays all the saxophones, and it's just amazing. Um, uh, Tom Yorker's score to uh, 2018 Suspira uh, remake was phenomenal. I got to check that out. Can you send me a, a link to that? Uh, yes, I, uh, uh, even if I'm not a fan of Radiohead or Tommy Orkin, <laughs> is that a backhanded compliment? Okay. Was there any deleted tracks for Killer? No, there was no, actually there's technically there's a deleted track. There was, um, you know, the scene where the kid comes up to the gazebo and there's the puppet who's doing the puppet show. Well, that was a bit more complicated. And Charlie Kiyota says, can you take a lot of these elements out and make it super simple? Like really kind of like dumb it down a bit, and which I did. So there's two versions of that, but I don't know if you can call that a bonus track. So um, let me see, was it easy or hard to make music for you? No, it wasn't. Was it easy or hard? Well, it was a, okay, the question is, was it easy or hard to make the music for Killer Clowns? Actually, it was a lot of fun. That's all I can tell you. It was a lot of fun. The hardest part was going to the audition with a bunch of other composers at the screening and thinking, oh my goodness, there's like at least 30 other composers here. Some of them I knew and they had far more credits than I had and they have, they're, they're really good composers. So I was very, uh, to get past that point and get the movie was was that that's the only pressure point after that working with the Kyoto brothers was really uh 
a, a, a very creative experience because they are a creative bunch. They, uh, they're very good at expressing uh, verbally what they want to hear and see. Uh, it's not like they're telling, you know, they'll, they'll give me case scenarios like their favorite movies, right? They'll give me their, uh, what music they like, uh, the character of the music they wanted. I think I, I hit it on the nose because I did, I pr approached the music score for Killer Clowns very seriously, which counteracts the craziness of the movie. So let me scroll down here some more. Mamma Mia! <laughs> Bryson, who taught you to say that? Um, I'm going to have killer clowns for our space jacket for Christmas. Cool. Awesome. Take a picture. Send it to me. I'll tell you what. I never thought it would be so difficult to rewrite drums for something that is already so ingrained in my memory. Well, you, you just have to make it your own. You just have to forget about it. Listen to the track without the drums and start whacking. That doesn't sound right. I'm sorry. Start Beating those drums, that doesn't sound right either. Um, to start performing. Uh, Interstellar is one of my fave scores. Yes, I bet that was awesome on IMAX. I have to go watch the... Have you heard the scores from uh, Adastra? Really good. Adastra, Adastra, Adastra. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is that the one with Brad Pitt? Adastra? Hmm. If it is, that's that's a very interesting score as well. I think if the, if we're talking about the same movie, it's uh, Brad Pitt plays an astronaut who has to find his dad who's on a space station around Neptune or something like that. And the great thing about that score, it was it was so stark. And then there were moments of silence. And then when the music came in, it really meant something. Padilla, have you given yourself the challenge of recording an instrument part? on a demo in one take. Absolutely not. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I would never hire myself out. It's only for my own music and my own enjoyment, my own uh, amuse amusement, basically. Okay, Kimberly asks, tell us one fun fact about Killer Clowns from Outer Space we might not know. Okay, well, everyone gets this wrong. There's, there's one kill. Actually, there's two. There, yeah, there's two kills that everyone misses. And you'll have to message me for the answer because uh, you're just going to have to. You're going to have to message me for that answer. One of my favorite stories was your finding out you were seated next to Stephen Keogh. Oh, yeah, during my the, uh, the screening where they were picking the composers, I, I, I think I was sitting next to Stephen to Steve uh, Kyoto, and I found out later that, that, that it was indeed, because I recognized his voice from the phone call. Uh, hi from the UK. Hey, welcome. Uh, just get to... <laughs> Jonathan Bendia has a message for you, Bryson. Phantom of the Paradise is such an underrated movie. I agree. It came out before Rocky Horror... Uh, but doesn't get the recognition. I saw that movie twice in um, a movie, uh, in a drive-in movie theater. Well, it's not a drive-in movie theater. It's at a drive-in. And there's that scene where the guy's just writing and writing and writing until he passes out. And that was John Williams. Uh, not John Williams, excuse me. Uh, Paul Williams, uh, the composer. He wrote a lot of hit songs. And um, that was a really good movie. Uh, I, I, I like movies where people have a, excuse me, people have a struggle. Um, and then at the end, they, they sometimes win, they sometimes lose. But it's, it's the journey that's the most important. Um, there's a movie I highly recommend. It's called Strad Style. It's a very triumphant movie. It's about um, a, a very interesting guy that lives in Ohio that makes copies of Stradivarius and Guarneri violins and it shows his struggle to, to for perfection and uh, to seeking that um, uh, that holy grail of making a violin that just sings and um, he goes to Cremona Italy and he gets to see where the masters uh, created all the uh, wonderful violins and he just uh it's a wonderful movie it's called strad style you'll want to see it 
Uh, Max Richter did the score. Yes. Uh, uh, tell me about it. I gotta start. Uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space reminds me a little of Tim Burton. You know, you're absolutely right. Um, that creepy cool kid. Because uh, it's around that time that um, uh, uh, Beetlejuice came out. Right? Beetlejuice came out. I forgot if it was before or after Killer Clowns. I think it was before. And I just love Beetlejuice. I thought the score that uh, Danny Elfman did was just so awesome. Uh, it's interesting because sometimes Danny Elfman's music to me sounds like um, Nina Rota's music from Fellini movies. <laughs> that certain character, that certain disjointed character to it. Uh, I really I really admire what he does. Um, and let me see here. What made you interested in music? Oh my goodness. Every, um, so what made me interested in music? Since I was a little kid, I um, always listened to the radio and uh, I wanted to play guitar and I ended up playing bass guitar, but uh, I, I made a guitar from uh, like a like a shoebox and I strung uh, some rubber bands across it and pretend I was playing guitar and I was always listening to the radio uh, my cousin Augusto is a um, for a, quite a while was a broadcaster he was a DJ in Italy before he became a um, uh, an editor of the national newspaper and uh, he used to practice uh, doing uh, he used to call them transmissions like broadcasts like radio shows like he would be the, the host and he would play records and stuff like that I did the same thing with music. I would be listening to the music and trying to play along with it. And uh, if you are going to ever, oh, someone asked me a question about vinyl. I will get to that in a second. Um, so um, <clears throat> what I used to do is that when I became proficient at various instruments, I would listen to a record of a song I really liked and I tried to play along with it. If it was the piano, I'd uh, try to, learn the chord progression, play along with it, maybe play the melody where I can play it in time and work with it. And that, that helps out a lot. If you can play along with your favorite songs, it's, it's a big help. Okay. Something about the vinyl pressing, uh, you know, I, uh, is a killer clowns vinyl pressing coming soon? You know, I can't, I can't, uh, uh, that wouldn't that be cool if there was a vinyl pressing, that would be the coolest thing. Um, yeah, that would be awesome. Is there ha happening? Well, you know, someone's got to do it. Someone's got to actually uh, buy the rights. <clears throat> I mean, I I have the rights to do my new reimagined music, um, but I don't have the rights to do the vinyl, unfortunately. <clears throat> my freshman year in high school, hold on a second. My freshman year in high school, I got to play sections from John Williams for marching band. Oh, that's got to be awesome. That has got to be awesome. Uh, you should go to a store called Halloween Town. It, you know, there's Halloween Town in Burbank, right? Any memory of composing for Retro Puppet Master? Yes, Retro Puppet Master was a lot of fun to, to score because uh, the director, David Cotto, is such an awesome guy. The company that produced... Um, I'm outspoken about this. The company that produced it was not fun to deal with because I was told by people inside the company, they will not pay you. After you deliver your final tape, they will not pay you. So if I were you, I would hold on to it. They And it's not fun to get ripped off. Let me tell you, it is not fun, especially by people that have a habit of doing it. And uh, I'm outspoken about it because I'm outspoken about it because it actually did happen if it was... I wouldn't, if it didn't happen, I wouldn't, I have nothing to say about it, but I, I want other people that are in the business to be aware that there are sometimes that people, you'll work for someone who has no intention of remunerating you. I mean, I mean, there are people who have been worked for me for free and I tell them, listen, I have no money to pay for you on this. This is the conditions. Do you want to be part of it? You're welcome to. Otherwise, that's what it is, you know, because there have been literally the budget for some projects I've worked on is this. There's zero money. So basically, you have to um, be up on your royalties, you know, and maybe over a period of many years, you'll make some money. But it's an, it's a very competitive, horrible business. So 
regarding that's that's uh, that's the story of um, Retro Puppet Master. I will never work for Full Moon or any subsidiary of them again. And um, if anyone else works for them, uh, just make sure you have a lawyer making up a nice contract. Do you uh, do you uh, any do I have any plans to extend the Killer Clowns universe? Like another movie or show? Well, that's a good question. I would love to do that. Are you kidding? Would I love to do another Killer Clowns movie? Of course. Would the Kyoto Brothers love to do another Killer Clowns movie? Of course we would. We do not own the property. The property is owned by MGM, Metro Golden Mayor. So if you would like to have a Killer Clowns uh, sequel or another movie or expand the universe, you've got to write a letter to them. Write a postcard. That, that means a lot. You know, if someone took the trouble to write a postcard, that means more than probably 10 emails. So I would recommend that. And we would, we're so there, ready to go. Uh, it just has to be financially feasible for the company that owns the property rights. Okay, I am very familiar with Full Moon, a band's reputation. I'm sorry to find out that was your experience. Yeah, I even I even told uh, Richard Band the story. He goes, yeah, that sounds... that's. It, <laughs> He's related to them. <laughs> I go, I'll probably never work for him again because I'm outspoken about it, but I don't care. So um, I'd rather work for really great people. Uh, you know, uh, keep keep really good company. So what else do we have here? Did I miss any questions? I'm going to... Uh, how long... Just out of Hello? Here we are. We've been at this for about a half an hour. Hey, Max... How you doing? Max is a buddy of mine. Look, Max, I got a bass guitar here that I'm breaking in. That someone is, uh, it's on loan to me. It's a Warwick bass. It's really awesome. So, uh, let me see here. Why was the Popcorn Clowns never killed? Good question. I don't know. Um, let me see. Do you, or have any plans to expand the Killer Clowns? You know, oh, you already asked. Uh, I answered that one. Which, uh, let me see. Which is the same because I also love Richard's music. I like Richard's music too. You know, he. You know, he. He's recorded a lot of those early um, uh, movies that he did um, in Italy. Some really great musicians out there in Europe. Well, guys, we've been at this for 35 minutes. This has been a really good first um, Music Mondays. And I have an idea for next week's. It's going to be completely different from this. I'm going to take you uh, a few steps on how I create a piece of music. Uh, I'll show you like one of the ways I go about it. Uh, Max said he has 99, a 99 cent guitar. He said it's that it's cool. I bet that's a cool guitar, especially when he plays it. Hey, Amber, how you doing? Demonic Toys has a great soundtrack. I bet it does. Yeah, uh, Richard Band's a cool guy. Richard Band writes some great music. So, uh, what is your third fave horror? What are three of my favorite horror movies? Okay, really quick. At the top of the, at the top is um the shining i like that uh there's uh, one called hill house i think it's called hill house it's a black and white movie made in the early 60s and then i'd say any of the giallo movies the italian horror movies because they were so raw and that's why i loved about it and their music was really great yeah the shining is really good shining is like grand opera Oh boy, I gotta practice. I don't have my I don't have my pinky finger working yet, as far as bass is concerned. Concerned. Anyways, everyone, I'm gonna say um, the haunting. That was it. That was it. I thought it was the the Hill House, but it's the haunting. That was so terrifying. That movie. I saw it when I was a kid. It was. It came on television, and I could not sleep at night. I was literally awake like this all night, waiting for the sun to come up hoping that nothing terrible would happen. And that's when my grandmother told me, she said, she said, uh, she didn't call me John, she called me grandma. She says, grandma, 
You don't have to worry about all the monsters and things and ghosts on TV. It's people in real life you have to worry about. <laughs> She's right. So I'm going to take you through the process of how I do a piece of music. And, um, and composing music is just like playing music. It, you've got to practice doing it. Um, there are times that for various reasons, uh, I don't compose anything for several weeks. And all of a sudden, boom, there's a project to do that's, that I'm going to be working on for three months. And I literally have to practice composing music, you know, um, coming up with an idea from scratch, um, and uh, coming up with a, a skeletal frame of how the whole piece of music is going to be, and then figuring out, <clears throat> you know, the, the arrangement of it, the, how, how it's going to work and how it's going to, uh, keep interest. And then, then you go to, there's various steps. Then you go into the, the actual composition, then, um, then you're recording it. And then there's the production, mixing it, you know, making it sound incredible. Um, didn't even mean to hit the button. I'm sorry, everybody. No problem. No problem at all. Um, Bryson, we'll, we'll, we'll do something some other time. Anyways, everyone, I'm going to say goodbye and God bless everyone. Take care. Thank you for spending uh, your lunch hour with me. And I will post this video on YouTube and hopefully, um, you can pick it apart and tell me what you did like and what you didn't like. And if you have any other questions, you can certainly message me. And if you have any, any requests, um, or if you have your own, your, your own music or your own artwork or anything like that, you want to show me, I'd be happy to see it. And I'll post it here on Instagram or I'll leave a link or something like that, especially if you do visual artwork. But if you post like, let's say a music video or, or you, playing a musical instrument or something like that, I'll definitely share it on my story. Anyways, take care, everyone. I really appreciate you all. And uh, hopefully when this pandemic thing is over, we'll have a, a, a big old get together and a big old hootenanny. Anyways, take care, everyone. Mwah.